G'day chaps, tis I, Clumpuncher139. Bosses are arguably the most important aspect of modern game design. Some games completely revolve around them, sometimes they're relegated to story-based checkpoints, and some have them as the big finale to a level or even the game itself. Regardless of how they're used, pretty much every game, regardless of genre, will find a way to incorporate something that could be called a boss fight. And today, I'm putting some of them under a spotlight as I break down 10 of my favorite boss fights in gaming. Keyword being, my favorites. I'm only looking at bosses that I have personally fought, so don't expect anything from PlayStation exclusives or Dark Souls or anything in between. Your opinions are completely irrelevant to this list. If you've fought a great boss and they don't appear on the list, sucks to be you, I guess. These are my opinions and I'm not going to include something that I haven't played. Two rules for this list. One, I'll only be including one boss per game or franchise, so only one Mario boss, one Star Wars boss, etc. And two, no Arkham bosses. If you want to know my favorites there, just look at my ranking videos. That's all there is to it, so spoiler alert for all the games I talk about, but I'll give a warning before the entry if you want to skip it. All that out of the way, let's get started with... <laughs> Let's go ahead and start this list with one of the examples I mentioned, Star Wars. Specifically, LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga. We all know this is one of the best video games of all time, but ironically that reason is not for its bosses. In all honesty, most of the bosses in The Complete Saga are kinda trash, or at the very least aren't that good. 90% of them devolve to performing a slash or stab attack until the health bar reaches zero, occasionally having to chase them through a tiny puzzle. One boss this no doubt applies to is the final boss of the game, Emperor Palpatine. And yet, it's able to strike a perfect balance of slashing and puzzling that it's easily the best boss in the game and one of the best LEGO bosses, period. Immediately we start with a deviation from the source material with Luke not fighting Vader and instead fighting Palps. But who cares when we have that enormous 18 heart health bar? What follows is a long, arduous battle against Palpatine where you get to play as Vader, let's go! It of course starts with some whacking of the Emperor to whittle his health bar down, taking a bit of inspiration from Dooku and using Force Lightning to keep you at bay. Then he starts running away and you get to the puzzles. First you're forced to use Vader's Sith Force powers, which are technically being introduced to you in this fight, but it works because, let's face it, you're gonna be playing as Vader for most of this fight. Then we get something new with Palpatine electrifying the floor, forcing you to navigate a treacherous maze. You fight Palpy some more, and then fight some guards while he runs away. And these guys are actually dangerous, unless you do the logical thing and play as Vader, in which case you can just choke him out. Then you follow Palpy some more, beat him up, follow him up an elevator with a simple puzzle utilizing both Skywalkers, he keeps running away like a coward, and we come to the final hit. Palpatine runs to the center of the arena, right next to the reactor shaft Vader throws him down in the movie. We land that final hit, and the Sith Lord is defeated once and for all. You don't exist! Don't debate this in the comments. Palpatine is a great final fight for the complete saga, just because of how epic it is. For one, you actually get to play as Vader. Sure, he doesn't technically play any different than the rest of the cast, but it's the feeling that counts. There's a great set of puzzles leading up to the incredibly long beatdown of this old man, and it's just a fun time. It's a fantastic finale that wraps up the complete saga in a very nice bow. If only it was actually the final level and not followed up with what's basically a glorified auto-scroller, but I don't care. Moving on. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate really is ultimate. And even though I desperately crave more DLC sometime in the future, I really do think, and in some ways hope, that this is the end of Smash Bros. And if it is, at least they went out with a damn great boss fight at the end of World of Light. Galeem and Darkon are an absolutely excellent fight, and on higher difficulties are some of the toughest opponents you'll ever face in Smash Bros. history. Part of that is because it's an incredibly long, three-stage gauntlet you have to fight through. You start with a basic platforming section with a few enemies you need to defeat, while also keeping the floating orbs at bay. And when you reach the top, you now have an intense boss rush against every enemy you've defeated until this point. Giga Bowser, Dracula, Rathalos, Ganon, Gallium, and Marx. You need to defeat all of them with just three lives, and while only getting healing items after defeating two. Their difficulty is one thing, 
but they even decide to attack you outside of battle, and they hurt if you're not prepared. But if you can make it through the intense boss rush, you're only halfway done. Because now it's time to face the ones you're here for, Galim and Darkon. This fight plays out very differently from all the others you've faced, because you aren't really the opponent in this fight. This fight is more Galim and Darkon fighting each other, and you just so happen to be caught in the middle of their attacks. And while you try to avoid these incidental attacks, you have to wear down their absolutely enormous health bars with just three stocks. Despite both just being floating orbs with strange tendrils, Gleam and Darkon actually have decently established personalities that shine, pun intended, throughout the whole fight. Gleam is far more elegant in its movements, and is more interested in taking you out quickly and efficiently, with no room for wasted time. Meanwhile, Darkon is far more outwardly violent, taking a more sadistic and chaotic approach to defeating you no matter how long it takes. And they both have unique attacks to back these traits up, and even their shared ones are tailor-made to fit their personalities. For instance, the Bomberman bombs that both share are treated differently for each orb. Galeems are straight and a plus sign, which go for efficient spacing, while Darkons are tilted to make an X, creating a more chaotic dodging scenario. Then you've got all their other attacks that, again, aren't even trying to hit you specifically and that damage the other boss, which is very helpful, especially by the time you enter Phase 2. At half health, both bosses will freak out and become unbelievably powerful. Each gains a defense and offense buff that will absolutely shred you to bits, along with even more chaotic attacks, even taking notes from Taboo from Brawl. Their attacks become nearly impossible to dodge, especially in tandem with one another, to the point you just need to take the hits and release as much damage as you can in a short amount of time. And when you KO one, the fight doesn't become easier by a sliver, as the remaining orb will gain a massive defense and moveset buff, forcing you to whittle it down even slower while avoiding some of the hardest hitting attacks in the game. But if you can survive both the light and darkness for long enough, you'll win the fight. They somehow made orbs orbs into an interesting and incredibly fun fight. Thank you, Sakurai, for all you've done. Enjoy that vacation, because you deserve it after giving us the single greatest crossover fighting game in history. I was almost stupid enough to leave this fight off the list. However, a revisit to Plants vs. Zombies made me remember just why this game is so perfect. Part of that is the finale. Your Roof, Day 10. A look to the right reveals... No zombies? Hmm... Oh. My. God. Dr. Zomboss is not playing around. He goes right ahead and parks a giant freaking robot on your roof, clearly not caring about the possible structural damage to your house. And rather than just placing a zombie right into your chimney, he goes ahead and places them at his feet. Now you've got three catapults, flower pots, ice shrooms, and jalapenos to fend them off and defeat this giant freaking robot. Zomboss will randomly place zombies as the fight goes on, starting with basics and cone heads, then evolving to bucket heads after he dips his head down. And after that, it's a who's who of zombies as we get everyone we faced except for the swimmers and, strangely, the dancers. You have to be prepared for anything, as every zombie type can be dropped at a moment's notice, making sure you remember everyone's weakness. Zomboss himself will only occasionally be vulnerable, as he'll sometimes drop his head down to spit out a fire or ice ball that will obliterate your lane without a second thought, and you have to use either a jalapeno or ice shroom depending on which one he spits. And those instas will actually affect Zomboss too, with the jalapeno dealing good damage and the ice shroom immobilizing him, allowing you to rack up damage. After retreating, he'll drop three bungee zombies to steal some plants, and do so quickly if you aren't prepared. After whittling down his health though, he'll say screw it and just throw a camper onto your roof, instantly destroying six of your plants. And don't think you can plant too close to him, as any plants past the lip of your roof are prime material to be crushed under his foot. This boss is so absolutely ridiculous and incredible. It makes sure you know the game, and I can imagine being somewhat difficult for first timers. And for veterans, it's an incredibly fun time to go back to. And have I mentioned Brainiac Maniac yet? One of the greatest final boss themes in history? Overall, Dr. Zomboss is just a great way to send off Plant vs. Zombies. It makes sure you know everything about the game and really puts you in your place if you don't. 
If Only Plants vs. Zombies 2 could follow up on this absolute masterpiece. Despite having no nostalgic connection to the series, I am in love with Punch-Out. I may not have known who Little Mac was when he first showed up in Smash 4, but now I can't get enough of him and his wide variety of bosses. Unlike the game itself though, choosing a winner was no challenge. Aaron Ryan. Ah! Let's go, let's go! What is there to say about Aaron Ryan? Well, like a boss you'll see later down this list, this guy breaks pretty much all the established rules the game has taught you. Punch-Out is all about avoiding your enemy's attacks before countering with your own. Furthermore, opposing boxers will stand their ground and face you head-on, only being pushed away by the sheer force of max punches. Aaron Ryan, however, breaks both of these rules, plus some. He is constantly dashing around the arena, keeping you on your toes as you prepare for his attack. And when he does attack, you don't just dodge and counterattack. If you do, he'll only take one punch, then retaliate with his own counter. Nah, instead, you have to literally beat him to the punch. This was partially tried back with King Hippo, but Eren takes it to the next level. He's faster, more agile, and probably stronger thanks to those horseshoes in his gloves. Which I guess segues into the other part of him breaking the rules. The fact that he literally breaks the rules of boxing. Aaron is a crafty bastard, as he decides to ignore the ref and throws in some questionably legal moves, most notably a headbutt and an elbow drop. The headbutt in particular being one of his most devastating blows. Oh, and let's not forget that he literally brings a weapon into the ring to fight Mac with. How does the WVBA allow this? You ever feel useless? Remember that Aaron has decision wins under his belt. Think about how those refs feel. Regardless, he uses these cheating moves to actually break even more of the established game rules. After countering one of Aaron's blows, he'll counter back himself, forcing you to dodge before getting the chance to wail on him. And after the stun, he'll counter back again with an uppercut, forcing you to be wary of your own punches. And just when you think you can get a breather and knock him down, Aaron throws one more sneaky trick into the mix. He'll use his weapon as a last-ditch effort to get some damage on you as he goes down. Is there nothing this guy won't do to win? All that, and I haven't even touched on his aesthetics. Aaron is Irish, and by god they couldn't have picked a better background. You're gonna love this, Mike. This gives him the interesting quirk of everything being based around the number 7. 7 punches in a combo, 7 seconds before he gets up on the count, 7 hearts for Mac, 7 star punches for an instant down, it's everywhere. His accent is absolutely perfect for this stupid yet ingenious boxer. Fightin's like breathing, Mac! And the music it gives him is absolutely godly. Aaron Ryan is simply the best of an already incredible roster, and I can only hope he'll show up in the next punch out. Please, Nintendo, make it happen. We know you bought out Next Level, so get them on it, please! If you want to feel like a man fighting through hell, you need look no further than Doom Eternal. While 2016 made you feel like the overpowered badass that is the Doom Slayer, Eternal decided to bend you over the Slayer's tomb and show you just who your daddy is. And with this sudden spike in difficulty came a wave of difficult new bosses for games journalists to cry over. Sure, the Marauders are kinda mean, but they're pushovers compared to the Icon of Sin. The Icon of Sin is the final boss of Doom Eternal, and by god does he let you know it. He's a colossal titan taking up literally the entire screen and then some, and it's up to you and a couple of bullets to somehow bring him down. Yeah, I'm gonna side with the guy carrying the big fucking gun over Satan's cranky younger brother any day. There's two phases to the Icon's fight, with each being insurmountably difficult for non-PC players like myself. In each phase, you must shoot his various body plates until they're destroyed, all while avoiding infinitely spawning demons out for your sphincter. And we're not just talking zombies and possessed soldiers here. 
We've got Kako Demons, Mancubi, Pinkies, Revenants, Dread Knights, Whiplashes, and pretty much everything else except for Lawn Barons. All the while, the Icon himself is constantly attacking the arena with punches, lasers, and more with no way for you to stop them. It's just you and your shotgun against all this ridiculous crap that you somehow come out on top against. Unless you're a speedrunner and chose to play this game like a sensible human being, you probably play this boss as a hit and run, dishing out as much damage as possible in a short amount of time before getting the heck out of dodge to kill a few demons and restore your health. I'll tell you what, while getting footage for this entry, I was in red HP for probably 30% of the fight. It's honestly insane how much this man can survive. It's especially difficult in the fact that you'll be running out of ammo constantly, and you only do mere chip damage to the icon unless you're literally using the BFG. But considering how rare ammo for that is, you won't be using it too often, and will have to rely on good old fashioned 50 cal and buckshot. I don't know guns, don't yell at me for being wrong. Rinse and repeat for two incredibly long phases until you stab the icon right in the head with your crucible, sending it back to hell while it shall remain eternally. This fight is absolutely insane, and really puts your skills to the test as the final obstacle the Slayer faces. It's absolutely ludicrous, but also so much fun. Just like Doom Eternal itself. Here's a real high-class bout. It's on! We waited four years for Cuphead the Delicious Last Course, and somehow, Somehow, Studio MDHR made the wait worth it in every conceivable way. They were somehow able to create a whole host of new bosses that are all incredibly unique and push the boundaries of what the game is capable of every single time. I honestly didn't think the final boss was going to be all that special going in, since the Devil and King dice of the base game were really just hard and that's about it. But somehow, Chef Saltbaker ended up being my absolute favorite boss in all of Cuphead. Let's get his aesthetic straight first. Dude's a literal psychopath and should absolutely be considered the main villain of this game, DLC or otherwise. The devil at least technically had a right to our souls, even if he probably rigged the crafts game against us. We had a contract that we broke, so he had every right to kill us. Saltbaker is just a straight murderer who wants to basically take over the world. Already I love this guy, now let's kill him and save Miss Chalice. Oh, but first, have a little listen to this flute in the background. A brawl is surely brewing. Now go! Doesn't that sound familiar? Hello there. Anyway, time to spill some salt. Well, that certainly won't be easy, as he goes ahead and uses living ingredients and fireballs to kill us. Yes, I'm playing on regular mode, sue me. At least Satan's minions probably wanted us to die for their boss. These ingredients are just being brutally murdered for the sake of hitting our little cup boys. But it doesn't work, and eventually he decides to grow bigger. And the fight has completely turned on its head. You can't even attack Salt Baker directly now, but have to use his weapons against him by shooting the pepper shakers until they blast into his face. This is a boss trope I absolutely love to see, and I'm so glad Cuphead finally did it. After shattering his glass and exposing the salt, you get a relatively easy phase that I pretty much always immediately finish with a super attack. But then comes the final phase, and by god is it still incredibly difficult despite being so short. Salt Baker's heart, yeah he somehow has one, is nearly impossible to hit while also focusing on staying alive with the platforms. It's an incredibly tense final phase, especially with the music. If you can somehow survive and land enough hits to take his health all the way down, you'll beat the boss and the delicious last course. And by god, with everything else they crammed into this pack, I'm amazed the final boss turned out this amazing. And I know it's nothing new to compliment Cuphead's animation, but by god, they went all out with Salty Boy here. Everything he does is so smooth, he looks like a classic, actually evil Disney villain. And need I mention the music? The Devil's theme was more chaotic than intimidating, but they went completely into the evil spectrum with Saltbaker. We've got organs, violins, a chorus, just a full-blown orchestra, and somehow it's still jazzy enough to fit right in with the rest of the OST. It's amazing what they were able to accomplish with the delicious last course, but it proves MDHR still got it. I can only hope this isn't really the end of Cuphead, because this just makes me want so much more.
Epic Mickey is a very strange game. It has the potential to be one of the greatest Disney games out there, able to rival Kingdom Hearts, but is plagued by a terrible camera and minimal effort voice acting. That said, it more than makes up for that with gameplay and story. Except ironically in one aspect, the bosses. Most boss fights in this game are incredibly simple and can be boiled down to dodge attack, painter thinner the weak point, repeat. There are two exceptions to this, thankfully. The final boss, who takes on a long platforming and minion fighting gauntlet, but it wasn't quite good enough to take the place from an earlier fight. Captain Hook. Good lord, this fight is ridiculously fantastic. While I still don't understand why Captain Hook is a forgotten character, I could care less because of how well done this fight is. The other fights in the game only have one path, whether you choose paint or thinner has basically no effect on how the fight itself goes, only the outcome. Captain Hook is different though, as your choice of liquid gives you a totally different experience, as the fight has not one, not two, but three different fights and endings depending on how you play. Let's start with the thinner experiences. If you take the thinner path, your task is to simply knock Hook off the plank into the jaws of the crocodile, or miss the objectives enough to smash him to bits. To do the plank path, however, you have to hit Hook onto levers to activate certain points. These include setting up the plank itself, and the pathway to get there. To hit Hook, you have to thin out the barrel he's hiding in and then spin attack him. Depending on the path laid out for him, he could smack his face on the walls or ground, or spin one of the rails into place. While you're attempting to do this, Hook will be shooting thinner and bombs at you with his little hand cannon. If he smacks his head enough times, he'll just burst into a bunch of pieces, defeated. If he can line up all the pieces and hit him off the plank though, he'll fall into the crocodile's mouth, still defeated. Both of these paths, especially the plank path, provide a fun and unique challenge, as you have to line up specific paths for Hook to follow, all while avoiding his own attacks. It's a very fun and unique fight, but by itself probably wouldn't be on this list. But now let's talk about the somehow even better paint experience. If you choose to be a good guy and don't want to beat up Hook, you can choose to ignore his warnings and head up to the wheel. Then just keep going up to start climbing the rigging of the Jolly Roger. Now you're climbing on the sails of a pirate ship in the middle of a thunderstorm, avoiding thinner attacks from the captain who's following you on a giant hook, and listening to an epic soundtrack as you attempt to reach the sprite at the top. Now you must get creative with your paint and thinner to manipulate the rigging to create platforms you can jump to to reach the top, all while Hook keeps shooting the opposite of what you need to hinder your progress or shoot you down. It's a truly awesome moment and really puts the epic in Epic Mickey. Soon enough you'll reach the sprite at the top of the crow's nest and break it free. Doing so summons Pete Pan to defeat Hook on his own, in a hilarious homage to the original Peter Pan and a fantastic conclusion to this boss. Captain Hook just does everything right. He should have been the baseline for bosses in Epic Mickey, not the high point. But I'll take what we got, and what we got was an amazing use of the game's mechanics to create a fantastic boss. <laughs> when it dropped, A Hat in Time was constantly compared to Super Mario Odyssey for literally no reason. Sure, they're both 3D platformers with a moderate emphasis on hats, but that's where they end. If anything, it's more like 64 and Sunshine with how the game progresses, not Odyssey. So please, stop comparing the two and just play them both. Point being, it's a great game and you should play it, because it happens to contain one of the greatest characters ever brought to fiction, The Snatcher. Do you have a death wish, kid? I've got plenty! Snatcher was already the best character ever in the base game, and had a pretty great boss there as well, so when I saw he got his own special DLC, I couldn't be happier. Seal the Deal contains the Death Wish campaign, essentially just Kaizo versions of already existing missions. And one such mission to get the Kaizo treatment was Your Contract Has Expired, renamed to Breaching the Contract. Now, Snatcher is even more handsome than normal, and has been so incredibly beefed up, he gained the suffix of EX. Say goodbye to that little head of yours. Snatcher is incredibly ramped up in terms of difficulty, and it's really only for one reason. Shockwaves. That's basically the only major thing they changed about this fight, and that makes it at least five times harder. Now, whenever he does a Power Geyser attack, a shockwave will accompany it, 
forcing you to correct your jumps to also jump over those. And he feels the need to do a lot of geyser attacks. Minion sweep? Shoot some geysers to throw Hat Kid off. Throwing potions? Shoot a spiral of geysers that slow down to the perfect speed to trap you at your base running speed. Shooting three geysers at the field at a time? Shoot even more less than a second later with barely any time to react, let alone jump over the shockwaves. All these attacks are thrown at you at complete random after the first bottle throw, and they combo into each other so well in many cases. Snatcher can only be damaged from two of his attacks, and only one if you do the bonus challenge, and there's basically no way to know when they're gonna pop up, or if he's just gonna murder you in seven seconds with a triple geyser attack. Seriously, that one attack has ended more runs than any other, just look at all my deaths on this fight! But even so, I still absolutely love it. It's absolute chaos incarnate, which I think is just what Snatcher would have wanted. And while not technically part of this fight, his theme is absolutely masterful. One of the best boss themes I've ever heard. Death Wish is also pretty great, but Your Contract Has Expired is a perfect representation of the character of Snatcher. Overall, Snatcher EX is an incredibly fun fight that really puts all your platforming skills to the test, without any need of those pesky hats. It's very difficult, but very fun. Did you just color me blue with my own attack? To be completely blunt, I don't care at all for New Super Mario Bros. Wii. I really don't have any reason why, but this entry in particular just never worked for me. I've gone back to all the other entries for one reason or another, but not Wii. And that's kind of a shame, because it contains what I would argue is the greatest Bowser fight in Mario history. Admittedly, it doesn't start off great, with the same old thing we've seen in every Mario game. Fireballs down a long hallway, Bowser on a bridge, and a nice red button for us to hit. Hit it, send Bowser to his untimely demise, and save the princess. <laughs> Turns out Peach was actually Kamek all along, and he uses his magic to do what we know he does best. Make Bowser big. But not just Mega Mushroom big, I'm talking Kaiju big. Bowser is arguably the largest he's ever been in this fight, and he is out for blood. He doesn't care how much damage he does to his own castle or minions, he is taking Mario out. Now what we have is a difficult platformer that sees Bowser carving the path for us with his fireballs. You have to align Mario in places for Bowser to shoot fire to create a path forward and escape before he catches you. And catch you, he will try as getting too far away from Bowser will cause him to leap at you, destroying everything in his path and putting him right on your butt. After escaping the maze, everything opens a lot more in Phase 2, but it also adds lava. Real gamers don't use the propeller shroom, and I am a real gamer. Now you have to dodge Bowser's attacks, keep a considerable distance from him, and stay high enough to above the lava to avoid the waves Bowser sends when he jumps all while you jump to increasingly tighter moving platforms that get closer and closer to the lava as you keep going in hopes of finding something to stop Bowser with. And just then, as you narrowly avoid a lava wave while crouching under a wall, you hear it. Peach's cry for help. And then you see it, the large button that will surely do something to defeat Bowser. And defeat him it does, as you basically flush him and all the lava down the drain. And throughout all of this, you listen to arguably the best final boss theme in Mario history, at least for platformers. The bells are incredibly dramatic and set the perfect mood for this fight, and the chorus chiming in during the lava phase is just the icing on Peach's cake. It is truly a masterful fight that I'll probably go into more detail over in another video. Undertale is a nearly perfect game, and every one of its bosses deserves to be commended. If we're talking about everything I've experienced from the game, 
Asgore and Flowey would probably take this spot, as they did in my top 10 Undertale bosses list that no longer exists. However, today I wanted to strictly look at gameplay, and I don't think any boss has made me have as much fun and frustration as Sans. As of right now, Sans is the hardest boss I have ever beaten, and frankly, it shouldn't surprise anyone who's actually fought him. Sans is significantly harder than every other enemy in Undertale, to the point that his fight is borderline bullcrap. Even his genocide buddy Undyne doesn't hold a candle to the amount of bullcrap that Sans can pull. So let's get to it. After taking a moment to warn you to walk away, he makes his famous little speech about birds and flowers, and then we're off. Every other enemy in Undertale is nice enough to give you the first move. But not Sans, as he very quickly cuts himself off and goes into his strongest attack. He always wondered why people don't start with it, and get used to it because you have to survive it every single time you'll lose. And then you're off. And for the next 20 plus turns, you have to survive some of the most precise and ridiculous attacks in the game. Most of them utilize the blue soul seen in Papyrus' fight. You know, platforming. Only difference here is that Sans makes sure you know how the gravity works as you have very tiny gaps that you can just barely squeeze between, all at varying heights. Along with that are these lasers called Gaster Blasters that will linger for a lot longer than you think, potentially damaging you when you didn't think they would. Oh, but not to worry, Sans is the easiest enemy in the game, with only one attack and one defense, so he should be easy, right? Well, he has a little something called Karmic Retribution, which, simply put, removes your invincibility frames meaning you will take one point of damage for every single frame you touch an attack, plus some poison damage just because he can. And despite being the laziest character in fiction, he has the highest agility possible and can dodge every single one of your attacks, and the only way to beat him is to wear him out from dodging. So you have to attack him to progress the battle, or else be stuck in an endless loop of getting attacked and uselessly healing. And did I mention that Sans breaks just about every other rule of the game too? Halfway through the battle, he'll try to appeal to your nice side and let you spare him. And if you do, he'll straight up insta-kill you, play dog song, and tell you to get dunked on. <laughs> if you don't take him up on that offer, he'll start attacking you with randomly generated attacks that would absolutely kill you if he didn't flash away and attack you with something else. And after that, Sans has some of the most devastating attacks in the game. But before you can face those, you have to dodge the menu. Yeah, Sans decides to attack you in the menu, the one place you're supposed to feel safe. And if you can somehow survive all of that, you'll have to survive his ridiculous final attack, complete with double-layered gravity bones, a very long horizontal falling section, and a circle of gaster blasters that lasts upwards of 5 seconds. All before Sans gets tired of throwing all this at you and just slams you against the walls a bunch of times as a last ditch attempt to kill you. And then he uses his special attack. How funny. This is just a glorified cutscene and all you have to do is let Sans fall asleep. Then you can literally move the combat box to the fight button and kill him. It's one thing that this fight breaks every rule the game set up prior, but it's another that it was able to make it so fun. I see it like a Cuphead boss on Expert. Almost unnecessarily hard, but as you progress, it becomes so much fun. And the difficulty is just to remind you of what you did. You killed everybody in the underground, and now you pay. And pay you do, but you get to listen to Megalovania while you do it. Quite possibly the greatest final boss theme in history. Sans just does everything right for his position. He was already a great character, but this fight made him even better. Sans is by far the best fight I've ever experienced. From his unique mechanics to the incredible difficulty and just how much fun he is. I may have raged more than any other fight on this list, but there's a reason I have a shirt praising my accomplishment. <laughs>
And that will conclude this list, chaps. Thanks for watching. If you've got a favorite boss that you didn't see on this list, tell me in the comments about how stupid I am for excluding them. Or if you have many, tell me how you'd place them in your own list. Either way, be sure to do all the YouTube stuff because I just had a really bad time. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later, chaps. <laughs>